Hey, you might have heard of the Concorde, but Boom is trying to bring supersonic air flight back. We're here in Colorado and we're going to go see their hangar and what they're building. So we're looking at the mock-up of the XB-1 supersonic demonstrator, or Baby Boom as we like to call her. This is our first supersonic airplane uh, that we will uh, start building shortly here and I expect to fly in about a year. The mission of the company is to bring back supersonic travel and make it widely affordable. And uh, we're taking that step by step. So this is actually a one-third scale realization of our passenger airliner. Uh, it will prove out the aerodynamics, the propulsion, the materials. And when that flies, then we know that we're ready to go ahead and design the, uh, the passenger airliner, which you can think of as a Concorde replacement. So how is this physically different from uh, the current jets that we use today? Starting with the aerodynamics, the shape is different. Supersonic airplanes, to be efficient, need to be long and skinny. Uh, they also need to have a very dynamically tailored fuselage. So you might notice on the boom aircraft, it's a little bit thicker up front and it's a little bit thinner in the back where the wings stick out. The engines are different. We're, for our production airplane, we're actually taking a subsonic engine and adapting it for supersonic flight. So this is what's known as a delta wing. So it's a triangular shaped wing. That design allows it to fly at a wide range of speed. So it's efficient for supersonic flight, but also can uh, operate at low speed. Lift is transferred over the wing differently than in a subsonic aircraft. So at that high angle, um, we have to really be concerned about seeing the runway and make sure the pilot has the visibility he needs to get on the ground. The Concorde did that with a droop nose. Their nose actually mechanically tipped forward so the pilot could physically see the runway. We have amazing innovations in technology now that would allow us to use synthetic vision rather than a big, heavy mechanical system to accomplish the same task. On a subsonic aircraft, you know, the intake is nothing but a hole in front of the engine. On a supersonic aircraft, you have to slow down the oncoming Mach 2 air, and by the time it reaches the engine, it's slowed to about half the speed of sound. This is one of three engines that will power the XB-1 supersonic demonstrator. Uh, it's actually a relatively old engine design, originally built for a Mach 2 cruise missile, so it's the perfect size and speed capability for our airplane. Wind tunnel iteration costs like millions of dollars and takes six months. Now you can iterate every 30 minutes. It allows you to test a lot more ideas and come up with a more refined, more aerodynamic design. And then as the last step, you go into a wind tunnel and confirm that you're seeing with real air what you expected in simulation. Flying supersonic is definitely a challenge for flight control specifically. You're going through different speed ranges, which means the pilot wants to handle the aircraft differently. It's like driving your car on the highway versus on a city street. You're not going to want to turn as much when you're going really fast. So my job is to make that handling quality change throughout the speed regimes transparent to the pilot. So the flying quality has remained the same and he feels comfortable at all flight speeds. Since we're designing a demonstrator that has a tandem cockpit, it's a forward pilot and an aft pilot, it'll be very similar feeling to a military style cockpit. The controls will be in similar locations. We get inspiration from a lot of those military aircraft cockpits. So Concorde famously was economically viable on just one route, New York to London. With Boom, because the operating costs are lower and because there's now been a, a spike in global travel, there are over 500 routes on the planet that are viable for supersonic. So not just New York to London, but San Francisco to Tokyo, Seattle to Shanghai, Los Angeles to Sydney. And on each of those routes, you can get a big speed up. The flights will be like half as long. So today we are curing our very first wings par part. So the, the way you actually build a carbon part is you uh, lay up uh, layers of layers of carbon fabric in a mold uh, and then uh, you infuse resin through it and as the last step you put the whole thing in a vacuum bag uh, which will squish down those layers of carbon uh, resulting in a, you know, a compact strong part. And uh, later this week we will be doing our first structural test on it. Uh, which basically means we load it up with several thousand pounds of force and test that it fails and breaks where we expect it to. So you're that intentionally going to? We're intentionally going to break it, um, and that will give us the calibration data to know how much, uh, how much material to put in the production aircraft parts. Concorde was designed in the 1960s, before we had the technology for efficient supersonic flight. And today we've got better aerodynamics, better materials, better engines, and you can design an airplane that's significantly more fuel efficient than Concorde and can work on many more routes. So you get economies of scale and you get reduced operating costs. A ticket on Concorde would set you back $20,000 round trip New York to London, and we'll be able to do this for about $5,000, so it's significantly more affordable. And the direction we're headed long term is to make the fastest flight also the cheaper one.